close to a million is what the KPI would be for a super cycle. And why I like it is no one's talking about it. No, no one even thinks that's possible. And, and everyone just thinks it's going to do what it did before. And it's a very different environment. Hello there. Before we get into today's show, I do want to do a little bit of self-promotion. I've just launched my new newsletter. It's available at neveredit.com. This is a newsletter which covers all things macro, Bitcoin and tech. So if you want to register, head over to neveredit.com and enter your email address. And that comes out daily, Monday to Friday. Anyway, hello there from Bedford, the Bitcoin mecca of the world. How are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by the Mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I've got an interview with Dan Held. This is the first in a three interview series I am doing with Dan, and today we're kicking off with the Bitcoin super cycle. But before that, I do have a message from my amazing show sponsors. Okay, firstly, today we're going to kick off with BlockFi. Now with BlockFi, you can open up an interesting account and earn money on your Bitcoin. I've been a customer of theirs for over a year and I've earned over one Bitcoin in interest and referrals, which is pretty cool. You can also use your Bitcoin as collateral and take out a USD loan and you can fund your BlockFi account directly from your Bitcoin wallet. And with the BlockFi mobile app, you can now fully manage your account on the go. With so much more coming, you should definitely check them out, but I do recommend you do your own research first, then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. Next up, we have Kraken, my favorite place for buying and selling Bitcoin, and the only place I use for buying and selling Bitcoin. But why, P? It's because they're a sponsor, right? Nope. Kraken is consistently rated the best and most secure crypto exchange, and I'm always telling you why security is really important for me. They also have the best in class in customer service. So if you've got an issue and you reach out to Kraken, whatever it is, they're going to get that shit fixed for you. And if you want to start trading Bitcoin, they have every tool you could possibly need. So whatever your level of experience, if you head over to Kraken.com, it could not be easier to sign up and start trading Bitcoin. They also have a beautiful mobile first app so you can buy Bitcoin on the go. And with their margin trading, futures and OTC desk, Kraken has every option covered for you. There is no better place to trade Bitcoin. You can find out more at Kraken.com or download the app. It's available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. Okay, so on to the show today, and I've got my good friend Dan Held on. I've known Dan for quite some time now, and he's probably just one of my best friends in Bitcoin. Always hanging out with him, always talking to him about Bitcoin, and he's always helping me with his education. And if you haven't signed up to Dan's email newsletter, I recommend it. He's sending out these little tutorials. I'm always telling you how good Marty Bent's email is. Well, Dan's is great as well. Dan tends to go into narrative pieces. And I've learned so much for them. I was like, come on, Dan, you need to come on the show. You need to record with me. And actually, we decided to do a three interview series covering a range of his topics. To kick off today, we're going to do the Bitcoin super cycle. Now, as a lot of you know, Bitcoin has typically gone through these huge bull markets, followed by multi-year bear markets where the price can see an 80% drawdown. Dan thinks this time might be different. At the end of last year, he wrote a thread on Twitter and went through the different catalysts that might make this cycle a super cycle. So obviously, I was like, Dan, man, you've got to come on the show and explain this. So this was a really cool interview. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you also come back on Friday and check out the next one where we're going to be looking at why Silicon Valley doesn't understand Bitcoin. And listen, if you have any questions, you got any feedback, you can reach out to me. It's hello at whatbitcoindid.com. I do reply to everyone. Sometimes it takes a few days. And also just don't send me any weird shit, but I will get back to you. Outside of that, go and check out Defiance. Actually, we've got a cool show coming out on Defiance this Thursday. We're going to be looking at the Wall Street bet stuff. That will be at defiance.news. And also sign up to my new newsletter. That's it, neveredit.com. Daily updates on tech, Bitcoin and macro. Have a great rest of your week and I will see you all on Friday. Dan, how you doing, brother? Doing well, bro. How's it been? Yeah, good man. Good man. As I said to you last time, it's uh, it's the longest I've ever been without seeing you in person. It's uh, it's been probably over a year now. I'm feeling pretty thirsty because every time we meet, I'm pretty sure we've got a pint in our hands. Yeah, usually have man. Usually grab a beer. And now it's been uh, last flight I took was March last year. Looks like we're on lockdown for another few months, but uh, hopefully Definitely. we'll come out of this. Yeah, I'm definitely missing the Bitcoiner community. I mean, those conferences were such, it's kind of like, you know, if you think of Bitcoin as a religion, those are going to church, (laughs) if you will. (laughs) And, uh, you know, San Francisco had a bunch of great Bitcoin meetups as well, like BitDevs. 
So it's uh, it's definitely, you know, COVID is definitely a lonely experience. And uh, for Bitcoiners, you know, it's such a such an intense feeling of being in Bitcoin when you ride the ups and downs. Not having that in-person interaction has made it a little bit more difficult for everyone. I, th- I think I've got it almost the worst because there's no one. There's no one around here I could go and talk to. I have to do it all online. Uh, if I was at least like in California somewhere, I could probably somehow break the rules and meet up with you or meet up with some other people. But look, it is what it is, dude. I feel like it's going to come to an end this year. We're going to get back to a relative normal, a new normal, whatever the fuck we're going to brand this. But <laughs> hopefully, man. I miss, I miss it, dude. I miss the conferences. Same, man. Are you going to go to the uh, BitBlock boom in Dallas? Because that should be right at the end of when COVID restrictions lift. When is it? Do you know when it is? It's in August in Dallas, Texas. The uh, the Bitcoin one. If it, the very Bitcoiner one. Well, listen. If it's uh, if it's August, I think there will be a chance because I think uh, I think our lockdown restrictions will have ended by then. It's whether I can get into America will be the question. But hey, it's in Dallas, man. I'll, I'd love to hang out with you in Dallas. Yeah, it's my home city, man. I grew up, spent 25 years in yeah. Dallas. It's uh, it's a fun city. I mean, look, there's nothing, there's no natural beauty around it. So all there is to do is eat and drink. So which, uh, you know, if that's your forte, it can be a good time. When I went to my first South by Southwest, I flew into Dallas because the flight was like half the price of Austin. So I flew into Dallas and hired a car. And then on the way back, I had a night, I had one night in Dallas Stayed at the Omni in the center. Oh, yeah. Uh, I loved it. I had I had a hell of a night. I'll tell you about that night sometime. But I had a hell of a <laughs> night. Really liked Dallas. Really liked the people. Good atmosphere. I could live in Dallas, man. I, I, I mean, I like Texas, as you know, but I did uh, I did like Dallas. So hopefully, man, fingers crossed, August big block boom, I'll be there, man. Anyway, we got a big, big topic to go through, right? Yeah, we do. So... So when I first discovered Bitcoin was like 2013, but didn't really properly discover it, didn't spend any time reading about it, bought some shit on the Silk Road, traded some CFDs, forgot about it, didn't really pay attention. Like observed I was in a cycle, watched Bitcoin hit 1200, watched it crash and just thought whatever this thing is, it's dead, move on. And then somehow, like, I used to check the price every now and again, and it was just going down and down again. And then it started going up and up again. And then back into 2016, early 2017, I got back in. I went through another cycle, and this time I went deeper. I learned a lot about Bitcoin, launched a podcast, you know, spent a bit more time learning it. And now I'm going through my third cycle, but this time I'm in a cycle, haven't properly experienced a full cycle, lived through it. But... We're going to talk about the super cycle, right? This is, uh, is this your thesis or is this something you've been working on with other people? T- talk to me, Dan. I'm sure there's been other Bitcoiners who've talked about super big bull runs, but the term super cycle, I believe I'm the first one to use it. But look, it's the internet. I'm sure there's other people who've probably used it in some sort of setting at one point. But to the best of my knowledge, there's no one else who's, who's talked about this super cycle that I'm, I'm going to reference. I did a show with Lynn Alden. I think it was the first show I did with Lynn Alden. And she was talking about um, boom and bust cycles. And what wraps the boom and bust cycle is a super boom and bust cycle, right? So I guess I'm I'm guessing ahead it's going to be something uh, similar. But before, before we get into it, I've got a lot of new listeners. Obviously, for obvious reasons, we're in a bull market. New people are coming in. I know this because I, I say to people, if you listen to the show, write to me. I will reply to you. I used to get like one email every three days. I'm getting like five to ten a day. Lots of people telling me they're new listeners, look, the show numbers are up. So uh, sometimes I don't mind going back and doing reminder bits. Uh, I think we should go back and do a few of those bits now. Look, if you've listened to these shows before, listened to Dan before, you might have heard this, but bear with it. I think I think a starting point should be going back and talking about Satoshi's intent. Um, you've done a lot of work on this. By the way, if you haven't checked out some of Dan's writings, we'll put the links in the show notes because... Dan's done some really, really good writing, re- 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 really good writings referring to some like original Satoshi ideas. Uh, planting Bitcoin was the first one, right? That's correct. Yeah, planting Bitcoin wasn't my first article, but it was the one that addressed Satoshi's intent and the origins of Bitcoin. W- was it the first in a set, though? Didn't you do a set around that time of articles, or was that just one of them? Yeah, planting Bitcoin was the set. So the the theme is that Satoshi's brilliance wasn't just in the species of money that he chose to plant but the season, the soil, and the gardening techniques that were all required to make it work. It was his go-to-market strategy that was equally brilliant. 
as choosing Bitcoin's genetic code. Right. So let's let's go back. Let's start through some of that. Let's go. Th- let's start with Satoshi's intent. You tell me about Satoshi's intent. If I think you're, uh, if you're going too deep, I'll like I'll reel I'll reel you back in and like get you to explain some stuff. I'll, I'll try my best not to go too down the rabbit hole. So we'll we'll stay at the uh, higher level of the rabbit hole. So for you know, if you're new to Bitcoin, you've probably heard a lot about this guy named Satoshi. This pseudonymous because we do he has a name which is Satoshi. He's not completely anonymous. That invented Bitcoin. But it's a super mysterious fellow who came, planted Bitcoin, helped create the community, and then mysteriously left and hasn't touched his coins since. And all we have left are his writings, his writings on the Bitcoin Talk Forum, on the P2P Foundation Forum, and via the cryptographer email list, which is uh, which was comprised of the cypher, cypherpunks. So we have this sort of piecemeal of, of information that gives us an idea of his intent, his motivations, decisions that he made. By the way, I use the word he because that's what he chose on his fa- P2P foundation profile as his gender. So some people like to say, we don't know, but he did self-select that. So I'm, I'm going to go with that for the to make it easier. Um, Satoshi was a really, really interesting guy because he had a wide variety of different understandings and perceptions of the world. This wasn't just like a computer hacker geek. I think a lot of people think of him as that, as like a, a hooded, kind of like how Peter looks here in his dark, dark room with his with his hood. <laughs> they think of him as this like hacker type. But I don't think <laughs> I don't think he was just that though. He he represented through his writings and through how he constructed Bitcoin. He had many other disciplines that he understood, like basic human incentives, like how to how do you incept a money from zero people that believe in it to the world believing it, believing in it. And Satoshi built Bitcoin with a 21 million hard cap in these cycles called halvings, which halvings induce these market cycles. But Satoshi even hypothesized that due to the inflexible monetary policy, the fact that there is no supply response to demand increasing. For example, if demand for gold increases, gold miners will go deeper and deeper into the earth to produce more gold. With Bitcoin, that doesn't occur. It's a, it's a fixed issuance rate. So that we can't really change the rate of issuance, and the max issuance is 21 million, which means that spikes in demand cause a spike in price because the supply doesn't change in response to that. Satoshi, before Bitcoin even was worth a penny, hypothesized that this would happen, which is pretty incredible that he thought, well, you know, maybe there might be FOMO cycles market cycles built on FOMO, and that could be the way that Bitcoin is brought into this world in terms of adoption. And he even talks about, like, he even describes FOMO where he goes, people might buy it in anticipation of the price going higher, and this increases the adoption of Bitcoin. This is pretty mind-blowing that, like, not only does he understand distributed systems, cryptography, money and the origins of money and why money is valuable. For example, Bitcoin's proof of work function mimics Nick Szabo's unforgeable costliness. The idea that money should always have a cost associated when creating it. He demonstrates all of this, which is like physics, code, human behavior, incentive modeling. And so I think like people really don't do him enough justice in terms of talking about, I mean, look, he, he is a human. He's not, he is not a, He's not a god. He's not someone, you know, incredible. Like he's not a he's not perfect, right? I'm sure he's got tons of flaws, and I think he understood that too. And I think that's what even makes it even more brilliant. Is Satoshi knew that due to human flaws that are innate in every human, that he had to be pseudonymous. That way, none of us can pick apart his faults of being from X creed, race, religion, or whatever. He's a, a kind of faceless entity for Bitcoin, and that's what a decentralized money needs. You don't need to put a face on it. And he was humble enough to understand that and then also humble enough to walk away. And and he walked away from the project and he didn't take any of his coins that he had mined. So Satoshi is one of the wealthiest people in the world, but he's never touched a penny of the money. For Satoshi, this was something much bigger than just like, he didn't care about making a buck. He didn't care about making a million dollars or billion dollars. Satoshi wanted to change the world. And so I think his story is super fascinating and how he created Bitcoin is just, a, I think, you know, for me, it was a personal fascination and I started to research it. Then I wrote Planting Bitcoin. That was a very popular series of articles. And uh, yeah, you know, from then on, I've, I've learned little bits and pieces afterwards. And, you know, I've had some funny questions around, um, you know, what what did Satoshi do wrong and, and whatnot. But yeah, it's been a fascinating journey. 
yeah, I mean, no one should expect him to have been perfect or created the perfect system. And he certainly had help from others. I mean, he wanted help. You know, he put it out there. He wanted help. And he certainly got a lot of help. If you go to the old Bitcoin talk forums, you can see the discussions. Um, and also, just as a side issue, I just wanted to bring up right now, like I often get asked, as you pro- pro- probably do, you know, who is Satoshi? Is it so-and-so? And I always say, Satoshi's given us this gift here. Satoshi's created this amazing thing called Bitcoin. And he wants to be anonymous and we should respect that uh do- and i even tweeted today if you dox him correctly or incorrectly both are completely irresponsible um and also despite the brilliance of satoshi i think it's moved on a lot since him it's a new system like it's it's developed other people have worked on it it's changed you know we do not want to have this uh demigod person and him coming out of the woodwork you know we'd probably end up finding his flaws and so I think it's good to move on, but at the same time, whilst paying respect to what he's done. And there's a couple of key things that I've learned from you that I really want to talk about as part of this before we talk about the super cycle. Um, I want to talk about the halving cycle as a as a, feed, as a uh, hype loop, as a marketing loop, because I think that's really important. But I think one step before there is you've corrected me a few times. A couple of times I've come to you and said, yeah, but Dan, I get the digital gold narrative, but this is a pivot because, you know, the white paper does say a peer-to-peer cash. You know, I understand why some people may have gone down the big block route because of that, but you don't agree with that, do you? Yeah, that's a great question. So if folks go read the white paper, which is titled a peer-to-peer electronic cash, they immediately go down this pathway of thinking of Bitcoin like through traditional fiat money, this medium of exchange currency, which you'd go use to pay for coffee, pay for sandwiches, and buy things online. So the white paper, by the way, Satoshi said the functional details, he is quoted to have seen the functional details are not in the white paper. He wrote the white paper as a marketing message to this group of people called the cypherpunks. These guys, mainly, I mean, I actually think it was all guys, <laughs> was actually a group of individuals that were had were the precursor. They had written about precursor like layers and, and components of Bitcoin, and Satoshi Frankensteined all those together to make Bitcoin, like Adam Back with proof of work, uh, incepting like proof of work and hash cash. Uh, and then you've got like Wei Dai, Hal Finney. Um, Satoshi leveraged all of their learnings to go build Bitcoin. So Satoshi goes, okay, cool. I built this thing called Bitcoin that this is the holy grail of what these cypherpunks have been looking for. And so he goes to this email newsletter group and then he posts it in there and he's like, hey guys, by the way, I wrote this thing called Bitcoin. So he's got to grab them with the title right away. And for them, they had been hunting for an e-cash or electronic cash. And by the way, Adam Back has on Twitter, him and I have had discussions about this and Adam largely agrees with this interpretation. Cash in the reference that Satoshi is using it in, which is how the cypherpunks use it, represents a final and private money. Final meaning it's after I give it to you, I can't take it back. And private meaning that it's somewhat, you know, um, there's no one who could censor the transaction and ideally we would preserve privacy. So this is what the individuals were looking for in this group. The individuals in this group were not looking for, (laughs) none of them really, very few of them cared about like Austrian economics and monetary policy. They were a group of mainly computer scientists, cryptographers who wanted like cash or like money for the internet. So Satoshi isn't going to go in there and ramble on and on about Keynesian economics and Austrian economics and the the power struggle there. He he succinctly compresses his narrative for his target demographic, which are these the cypherpunks. So a lot of people take that white paper and they take it totally out of context with how he uses the word cash. And then they don't read anything else he wrote. Because Satoshi writes a ton of other content. There's no reason why the white paper is any more or less important. And what's funny is that Satoshi even says the functional details are not included in the white paper. So so taking the white paper at face value and then not reading anything else is really disingenuous. And if we look at all of Satoshi's writings, how he constructed Bitcoin, you can tell that there's a, a much deeper intent than just becoming a, you know, a cheap PayPal for the internet. All right, cool. So let's move on to the next point. Let's talk about the halving cycle and... Uh, Again, it was you, the first person who raised this to me, but you said that created a marketing loop. And that was actually one of the most clever parts of the design. Um, Yeah, I think most people listening, well, not everyone, I'm not guaranteed that everyone will understand that the coin issuance was 50 per block when Bitcoin launched. And then we had a halving after the first four years, and it's 25 and 12 and a half and so on. Not everyone listening will know that. A lot of people will, but it's probably worth talking through that. And like, as I believe this is your theory, Yeah. So I look, you know, everyone, when they observe the world, they take whatever the mental models that they have and they use that to interpret things around them. 
So I'm using a bit of my own mental model and subjectivity to interpret how Satoshi thought about, you know, increasing adoption. So my background is in user acquisition or growth marketing. So in growth marketing, what we try to do is be really clever about ways we can acquire users for our products. And I've done all sorts of different techniques with my earliest Bitcoin startup, Zero Block. We did some wild stuff all the way to working at companies like Uber, where we acquired hundreds of millions of customers. So when Satoshi built Bitcoin, and this is where it's so brilliant with how he thinks through it, he's not just a he's not just a computer scientist who shits out Bitcoin and then hopes it does well. He thought through very carefully how it might be adopted, and he knew he wasn't going to be able to predict it, but he could hypothesize as to how it might come into this world. So what's really interesting about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin has a 21 million fixed issuance. As I mentioned before, there's no supply response in and when demand increases. There's almost no other asset like that. I mean, like fine art would be a good example as well, where you can't create copies of it. The additional copies don't create any sort of value. That scarcity of the 21 million is fixed. And Satoshi had to pick an issuance curve to issue those coins over time. So he could have had them all issued immediately, or he could have had them all issued over a very long time, or he could have had them issued over XYZ sort of time period. And he chose this one, which every four years, the amount of newly minted Bitcoins in each block drops in half. And that moment in which it switches over is called a halving. And the halving is a really interesting, uh, you know, in, in, in Bitcoin's a new money, right? It's a, no one's ever seen this before. Like we can't, we can't play back the origins of how gold became, <laughs> became a money in this world. It happened like 4,000 years ago. There's no data from back then. And when we look at Bitcoin, we look at, you know, the 12, 16 and, and 2020 halvings. And what's really interesting is we see a, a corresponding bull run, which is wild. So the basics of any market is supply and demand. If there's more demand than supply, the price goes up. If there's more supply than demand, the price goes down. That's how it works for everything in this world. Every single asset is traded, everything in life. And with Bitcoin, these halving cycles, what they create is a moment of um, like a, a shock, a supply shock to the system where now there is less supply being sold every day, which means that demand, if it stays constant, more uh, if so let's say you have constant supply and demand if that supply gets cut in half and there's the same amount of ma- demand and the price starts to creep up and when the price creeps up as satoshi hypothesized more people will p- become aware of it and buy in anticipation of the price going up which therefore increases the awareness and continues to build out the adoption cycle and that's what we've seen with bitcoin i've been around i've been building products in the space since uh january 2013 and with these cycles what happens is You build and build and build. Then the Bitcoin price cycle increases the awareness of Bitcoin and more people come and they sign up for wallets and exchanges and price trackers. And it's this virtuous loop of Satoshi tapping into the most fundamental nature of humans, which is being greedy. And he hoped that that would essentially create this viral loop of more people becoming greedy and then telling other people about it. And that would bring Bitcoin into, into existence. And it largely has. What's Mm -hmm. really interesting, too, is that people come for the speculation, but stay for the sound money. So not everyone who's drawn in by that human greed sticks around. That's why we see a bear market. But there's enough to where Bitcoin has never broken that, you know, essentially higher low levels to where Bitcoin continually builds believers in it that create the floor of Bitcoin's price. Because Bitcoin doesn't have a central bank or investment bank, bank that backs Bitcoin. Bitcoin's value is basically based on all of our belief in it. But it's really interesting to see how that played out over time. Back in 13, we weren't exactly sure how this all worked. I mean, we there had only been one having, you know, Bitcoin was a very small group of people. Their, the exchange infrastructure was very weak. So, you know, I think that like we, we this this theory over time, had we had kind of like thought about it and there wasn't almost any content in this space. I mean, Tur de Meester was the first piece of content I ever read was Tur's like research reports on Bitcoin. Wow. And he, he was like the Bitcoin economist back then. And then like, you know, two bit idiot over at um, Ryan Selkis over, you know, at, at um, Masari, I had the first newsfeed aggregator in the space. And he, I remember him emailing me and being like, Hey, can you add my blog? And I think he had the only blog in crypto. <laughs> there wasn't even Coindesk or Cointelegraph or any of these companies. So, you know, well, what Bitcoin, Bitcoin did or what, I mean, what, where would we be, we'd be without what Bitcoin did. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't really like, I think the, 
the compression of Bitcoin's narrative and the understanding of these cycles and all the analysis of on-chain data, that really came after 2017. That was, we were kind of like operating in the dark and there was like Willy Woo who did some analysis back then. But I think he was like the only one. I mean, there was like Tur was like the only Bitcoin economist. Willie was like the only on-chain data guy. <laughs> it was a very, very niche space. And now we've got so much more information. We've got so much better understanding of how Bitcoin works, how, how you know, everything works behind it from the social consensus to proof of work that it, it's incredible to see. I think a lot of us back then just had to really believe in it and understand some of the basic values of it. But there just wasn't a lot of content. Well, these, t- these cycles teach you a lot as well. I mean, I remember my you know, first cycle, the price would shoot up. You think it's going to go up high, then it will drop, and then you get fearful, and you maybe sell, and then it goes back up, and like, shit, i got to rebuy back in. And <laughs> you would, you, 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 The biggest lesson you can learn, I think, is early lesson, is managing and being okay with volatility. Uh, we had a $12,000 drop over the space of a few days recently, and I was a bit like, meh, okay. Whereas, you know, Four years ago, that you know, let's say, look, the same proportional drop, that would have worried me. And the first, the first time around, definitely would. Um, so you learn a lot about that, and but also, I think you learn a lot during a bear market. I spend a lot of time in a bear market, you know, uh, consolidating your ideas and building your conviction uh, to the point where, look, I like, I would be lying if I said, Dan, I don't look at the price in dollars. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not looking at when I'm going to sell. I'm. I know at some point I will sell bits in the future and I'll be kind of mildly regretting it or disappointed, but you have to go through a full cycle to learn all this as well. So whilst these hype cycles are great for Bitcoin adoption, they're also great for the individual to build their own conviction. Yeah, that's a really, really nice way of putting it. I, a lot of people think I'm like the perfect hodler. Like my last mm-hmm. name is Dan Held. So yeah, I've been hodling be, for a long time. <laughs> Look, no one's a perfect hodler. I day traded back in 13 poorly. I would have had a bigger stack if I hadn't. I also mined prime coin because I'm like, oh, maybe Bitcoin's, or maybe proof of work could do something more useful. You know, everyone goes through their their understanding and experimentation with the space. And so I don't fault people for ever buying shit coins or whatnot. I mean, that's uh, it's just a natural part of the journey, right? Uh, for me, though, you know, after about a year of that, I was like, okay. I mean, and I was always still like 90% Bitcoin. I was like, okay, Bitcoin is what the innovation is here. Um, so I never really like, I didn't like totally sell all my coins or anything for another coin. I largely was into Bitcoin the entire time and then basically hundred percent for the rest of the time, um, you know, past like 2014. So for me, you know, it's really interesting to see how I've personally developed with that. And I think that's what you're touching on. And, you know, Bitcoin is kind of like a hero's journey, right? Like you go through these catal- catalysts and moments that change you as a person, um, for those who have seen Batman, you know, it's like, you know, I'm using the Bane voice here where he's like, I was born in the volatility, <laughs> you know, like that's how you feel after Bitcoin. You're like, I was molded by it. I was born by the, I was born in the volatility. That's, that's how I feel after eight years of Bitcoin is that I have endured the most volatile asset in human history. And, you know, volatility isn't inherently a bad thing, but it definitely makes you, you really have to double down on your beliefs and really understand it to be convicted in the trade. And that's where hodling is like this life philosophy, this, this learning that you learn of like, you know, foregoing short-term pleasures and looking at your long-term outlook and making sure to make decisions for the long-term. I, I think that hodling is a life philosophy that you could actually apply to personal relationships and to other business and other investments. I don't enter any other investment unless I'm planning on holding it for five to 10 years. Everyone should have that philosophy. You shouldn't be looking at a day-to-day you know, day-to-day process of like, I'm going to quickly enter an exit position and have no conviction. You should have conviction over something, believe in something and, and use a lot of research to, you know, uh, build that belief. It shouldn't just be based out of thin air, but ultimately you have to make a decision and stick with it. It's part of being a mature person. And well, I think dude, listen, is, is a core part of that. I think the, f- I mean, I'm trying to remember it's back in 2013. I'm pretty sure the first Bitcoin I bought was under a hundred dollars. Uh, and at the time I was like, Shit, this thing's expensive. Like hundred dollars for made up internet money. <laughs> what? Uh, and then I, you know, uh, like I said, I traded those CFDs, bought some stuff on the Silk Road, but I didn't end up with any Bitcoin at the end of 2013. When that cycle dropped, I just didn't have any. I didn't care about it. Then 2017, like I, you know, bought a few. I think I bought, bought th- three or four at the start, and then did some trading or whatever. I've been in, essentially in Bitcoin properly, let's say properly, for four, four and a half years now. The, the most Bitcoin, like actual Bitcoins themselves, I've bought 
has been over ten thousand dollars. So I've been through that entire cycle a couple of times, properly once. I've had all the opportunity to buy it at four thousand, five thousand. It was only when it kind of broke out from that ten thousand, I was like, okay, now I get it, and I bought at ten, at twelve, at seventeen, at twenty-two, and I suddenly realized it. But it took it took that breakout for me to get it. And I think that's why I say these these cycles teach you a lot about yourself. Uh, it's, it's also readjusted. Like, I don't want to be hyperbolic or sound religious about it. Some people are like, oh, I'm sure if my, uh, some people like Bitcoin detractors will listen to this, they'll be like, oh, you're just being, just being like your religious cold Bitcoiner. But like, it certainly does teach you a lot about money, discipline uh during these periods and and that financial discipline also is something that has been transferred across to the way i run my business as well so i think these cycles are super important uh i've, I've learned more about money in the last four years than the than, than the, the 36 previous to that and uh yeah i'm grateful for that but but the point is we are talking about cycles now and you're talking about super cycles so like what is different this time dan when you talk about super cycle tell me what your thesis is I've been around eight years in Bitcoin, which is like a fucking eternity. <laughs> I mean, Dude. this is, I oh, gee, honestly, man. I've actually got a picture coming out that I'm going to show you. I won't show you on the show, but I actually have some gray hairs coming in on my beard and I'm only 33. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> this is what eight years of hodling does to you. It doesn't come without risks. <laughs> yeah, you know, what? let's just talk about this actually, just very quickly before you do that. Yeah. Um, it is a stressful and it, it is a roller coaster. Basically, it is because it's sometimes yeah. it's stressful and sometimes exciting. It is a, a, a roller coaster. I've been through some really fucking stressful time over the last four years. I've been wealthy, nearly bankrupt, and like back to comfortable. Uh, it's it can be stressful because of those stupid decisions. And look, if you're new and you've got people just giving you advice about Bitcoin and they've been in it for years, take that fucking advice. <laughs> Listen to people. <laughs> We, yeah, learn from our mistakes, learn from the stresses that we went through, and hopefully you don't make the same. Yeah. But, you know, for me, like being around eight years has shown me a ton. I've seen so many narratives come and go. All these altcoins from 2014, 2017, and now, like people go, oh, are, you're just closed minded because you believe in Bitcoin. I'm like, I've tried a lot of different things. I'm not, I didn't just start with Bitcoin. I started with Bitcoin, played around with a bunch of other stuff, then came back to Bitcoin. And that's what most journeys are for Bitcoin maximalists is that they they do that. And I actually don't even consider myself a Bitcoin maximalist. I consider myself a Bitcoin realist. I'm just, it's a practical, it's 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 based on, if you look at like total addressable market, product market fit for the protocol, Bitcoin is a great investment. Um, the other ones are more, much more speculative. And when I look at these cycles though, what makes me very excited about this upcoming one, which could be, and I'll go into this in a little bit, a super cycle is that this time is different. The 2013 bull run, the 2017 bull run, it was mainly based on retail-driven speculation. The macro markets, the, ma the rest of the world, was doing fine. It was a large bull run. And these were mainly speculative cycles run by retail with a very shaky infrastructure, especially in 2013. You had Mt. Gox, which was a horrible infrastructure and a horrible critical component that broke down at the, at the peak. With this bull run, we've got a lot of different things lined up. One, we have COVID, which occurred. COVID was the catalyst moment that makes Bitcoin shine. With the COVID lens, when we look at Bitcoin, for most people who had dismissed it previously, now it makes sense. You, and that's where we see this echoed by the institutions, the, the managers of all the wealth in the world, the uh, large portion of the wealth in the world. They look at Bitcoin as a store of value, as a gold 2.0 which was my investment thesis back in 2012. That's what Bitcoin represents. It's a gold 2.0. And that is a huge value for the world. As we, as we saw governments, as re, the governments had re, their response to COVID being money printing, that will devalue these currencies eventually. And folks are looking at the 21 million fixed hard cap of Bitcoin. They're looking at this monetary policy. They're looking at Bitcoin's construction and how decentralized it is. And how you can store value in it and no one can take that value away from you as this incredible lifeboat. And, you know, it's hard for people to really understand that you need a lifeboat until your ship is sinking and you're like, oh shit, I need a lifeboat. Mm -hmm. But, you know, selling selling lifeboats when there's no ship sinking, there's not a big market for that. And so Bitcoin's a demand or people believing in Bitcoin, that market has grown tremendously to where now we have institutions, 
We also have a much more vast retail customer segment. So retail buyers can now buy Bitcoin and PayPal, Robinhood, Cash App. They can buy it everywhere. And eventually that's going to reach like brokerages like Fidelity, like within a retail brokerage, Fidelity or E-Trade and, and interactive brokers. Eventually you're going to be able to buy Bitcoin everywhere, which means Bitcoin can now tap into all demand that wants it. Additionally, retail can better understand Bitcoin due to like podcasts like what Bitcoin did. Um, some of my writings, hundreds of other Bitcoiners' writings, we've now compressed the narrative to where we convert someone from a no-coiner to a Bitcoiner much more rapidly than before. Before, you'd have to spend tons of time reading about it. Now, you could listen to two podcasts, watch one YouTube video, and read one article, and boom, you might be convicted. So we've got institutional demand, retail demand, the macro backdrop of this, this whole world kind of aflame. And then within the crypto community, we only have really one narrative right now. Gold 2.0, store of value. Bitcoin can totally dom Bitcoin totally dominates that narrative. Whereas before that narrative was dominated, like in the 2017 cycle, by Ethereum and ICOs. And so that really diminished the Bitcoin's resounding narrative of store of value. And that's where we're seeing Bitcoin's purpose for why it was built, you know, shown in this cycle as like in the in the macro world, Bitcoin stands out as this as this safe store of value. We've got more ways to buy it than ever. Bitcoin's not going to look like the other cycles. People go, oh, well, it's just going to have a typical cycle of it's going to go from this up this this, you know, 10x, 20x, and then we'll have a bear market. And I'm like, I don't think so. I, the world didn't realize why they needed Bitcoin back then. They just speculated on it. And now they realize why they need it. I mean, governments across the world are engaging in huge money printing operations. They're doing wealth confiscation. There is no better moment for Bitcoin than this moment. And then if you look at Bitcoin's fundamentals, oh, in the 2017 cycle, we had a civil war. <laughs> wow, well, yeah. Huge, Listen, I, I was going to throw two more things in there. I was going to say, firstly, um, yeah, the amount of things that should have killed Bitcoin the amount, of, the amount of things it's been through, Silk Road, Mount Gox, like its resilience now is proven. It's just pure resilience is proven uh, now. You know, when somebody like Shift talks about it going to zero and, and then somebody will retort back, well, uh, it's got more chance of going to a million than zero. They're entirely right, actually. The, the, the case for Bitcoin hitting zero is to me very, very tiny. Like I try and imagine the scenarios for zero and I just can't figure them out. Um, but a second and a more important point, is that I feel like we have this regulatory moat around it. So definitely in 2013, I was like, what the hell is this thing? I don't really get it. It just sounds dumb. 2017, I was definitely concerned. I was like, hmm, they could ban this. You know, China banned it. I know it's banned in Bolivia. I think it's banned in Pakistan. I was like, they can ban this. They certainly could. I mean, it would be difficult. It could still exist being banned. But like, if it was illegal in Europe and the US to use Bitcoin, yes, it could be this kind of like underground cypherpunk at all, but it wouldn't be what it is now, right? Um, it, it would have difficulties. I feel like it's got this regulatory moat around it now. Um, I think so many, so many companies are invested. So much of the infrastructure, especially in the US, exists. Actually, so much of the wealth exists in US hands. I certainly don't feel like the US is going to ban it. And if the US isn't going to ban it, I feel like a lot of other uh, Western nations aren't going to ban it. I also think they'll face a massive regulatory challenge. I think they'll find a massive there'd be a massive fight back against it. And I feel like, I think on the regulatory side, whilst we might have prying eyes who want to know more about what we're doing, who it is holding the Bitcoin, I do still feel like we have this regulatory moat now and I just don't see it getting banned. I don't I don't see that as a narrative. I, I, I thought that was a viable argument in 2017 that you had to defend because it was a possibility. I don't see that anymore. Yeah, that's a really inter interesting question around, you know, will governments ban Bitcoin? And I actually wrote an article about this uh, in my newsletter where I explored, you know, how would a government go about banning Bitcoin? Bitcoin was meant to be state level resistant, which Satoshi architected Bitcoin to survive attacks by governments, making it one of the most resilient pieces of software ever created. I think it is the most resilient piece of software ever created. Um and when we, you know, when we look back at the 13 and 17 cycles, that was definitely a concern. Back in 13, I thought I was going to have my door knocked in, <laughs> like, or kicked, sorry, kicked in. You know, I thought they were going to go, oh, you guys are undermining confidence in the U.S. dollar and Bitcoin is meant to, you know, be a world reserve currency, a new gold 2.0. Mm -hmm. We're going to come after you guys. And they didn't. And, and I realized, <laughs> I realized that, like, I've seen this future, but almost no one else had. 
And so most of the rest of the world considered us to be lunatics. <laughs> they go, hey, these Bitcoiners are a weird bunch. They're, they're a weird bunch of people. And I still think we're kind of perceived as that. The, the establishment is slowly waking up to Bitcoin, that Bitcoin's purpose is to be a store of value, and that is a threat to fiat currencies across the world. But if they take it seriously, that means they're actually scared of it. And, and so Bitcoin has this really weird game theory model with it. So Bitcoin is protected by all of us believing in it. That's what enables Bitcoin to survive. All of us believing in it and storing value in it. If Bitcoin's market penetration in terms of how many people in a population own Bitcoin, if that percentage goes above a certain level, Bitcoin becomes very hard to ban. As the politicians, the businesses, the hedge funds, the wealthy, the poor all own it. It makes it very hard to ban it or penalize it because if you were a politician who voted for that, you would then be immediately voted out of office because people would be pissed because you just made them lose a bunch of money. Um, and also these politicians will likely own it, <laughs> which makes them, you know, politicians are typically very, uh, they're not exactly what they would call public servants. Most politicians are just look for their own self-interest. They look out for their own self-interest. And so if they own Bitcoin, that's a good thing because then they won't attack it. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin is protected by adoption. It's a, based on how many people own it. And you mentioned, you know, we mentioned that PayPal, uh, Robinhood, Cash App have it. I mean, these are big companies and more and more of these will come in. That makes it very hard to ban it. And also, you'd have to ban it in every country in the world, which that has never worked for drug enforcement, nor has it worked for climate change. There, you know, governments yeah. across the world haven't come together to ban something or rally behind something because governments are inherently against each other on a variety of other issues. Well, so there the is the, uh, the other point, Dan, is that, I'm um, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm not sure if you listened to Nick Carter's uh, discussion on uh, Grant Williams' podcast with Mike Green yet. Um, very interesting discussion. But when Mike mentioned about the U.S. government banning it, when Nick Carter said, well, I've become a dissident. I mean, that's the reality. I mean, look, if the UK banned it, um, I would, it would all, it'd almost certainly now make me reconsider my residential status in the UK if they went to ban it. I was like, well, this is my life. This is what I do. I, I, totally. I'm off. And I will go to one of the environments which supports it, someone like Malta or, you know, I don't know, but I would go somewhere else. Yeah, we become citizens of Bitcoin in a way. Bitcoin yeah. supersedes national boundaries and by storing value in Bitcoin, now we're all incentivized to keep it alive and to to protect it. And also, we start to, when you believe in Bitcoin, you start to question the nature of your reality. You start to look around and you're like, wait, why do these laws exist? Why why am I having to provide an ID at the bank to withdraw my own cash? And yeah. you start to go down this rabbit hole of questioning everything. And once you start doing that, there's no way to go back. You've seen mm. the world for what it is. You've woken up to the matrix You've woken up to the world being, you know, these governments being largely ineffective. I think with COVID as well, COVID highlighted how ineffective governments were at doing their core job of doing the basics. <laughs> you know, like they weren't, they didn't use a ton of rigor and they didn't use a ton of, you know, for example, I live in San Francisco and we, we don't have outdoor dining right now, which is bizarre. I mean, there's, there's no data that outdoor transmission occurs between, you know, parties that are like that far apart. I can certainly see some, I do believe that, you know, COVID is a real threat and that people need to respond to it, but it's certainly not this, you know, the responses from these different governments to it were insane. I mean, and in California too, the California governor dined without a mask with his friends and family. And so did the mayor of San Francisco. And so did the Senator. She got a haircut without a mask, uh, Nancy Pelosi. So it's literally 1984 where you've got the privileged animals and you've got the rest of the animals. And they're like, well, those rules don't apply to us. Bitcoin is part of that process of, of once you understand that, and once you understand Bitcoin, you start to question everything else, and then you see how ridiculous the rest of this system is. So yeah, I think, you know, once you believe in Bitcoin, you're kind of like, I believe in my freedom, and I think I deserve that, and I've decided to store my wealth in that, and you can try to take that away from me, but you're going to create a rebel, you know, you're going to create a movement that'll move against you, because inherently we deserve to be free, we were born with that freedom, Governments immediately after you're born put, you know, <laughs> they put chains around you and go, oh, now you belong to us. Mm -hmm. But you were you weren't born that way. No one was born to be owned by anyone else. We were all born free, and Bitcoin gives us that right back. Yes. Well, listen, I'm going to pull you up on one thing then. So, you you said earlier you think the cycle is going to be like no other pre previous. It might not have the same bear market play out. So if it does play out like other cycles. 
I, th- I, I think I'm even getting this from one of your tweets. You think it'll be about a 250 days from now will be the peak. Now, if it plays like other cycles, we'll hit whatever price. Let's say for the sake of making this argument easy, it's, it's 100K. Could be two, could be three, could be a million, whatever. But let's say 100K, then perhaps we will see a 70 to 80 cent drawdown, which means we could drop down to 20, 30K. That's a potential. Do you th- do you see that possibly not happening in this cycle then? Do you see something different happening? Yeah, you're talking from peak to trough. So that yep. wouldn't happen instantly. That would happen from the top of the bull yeah, all the yeah. way to the bottom of the bear. I don't think so. And the reason why is that this time people understand it much better. So when I talked about those cycles before where you had people come for the speculation and stay for the sound money, well, more people now understand why it's sound money. Because of COVID, they better understand why Bitcoin is valuable. And they're not just in it for the quick you know, flip of a 1x, 2x return. They're in it because they need to flee policies uh, with their local governments, where their local governments are printing tons of money and devaluing their currency. And that's where I've seen the narrative shift with friends and family who never believed in Bitcoin before. And now they're like, I need to get my money the hell out of here. You know, this is a this is a, a way to escape. Um, so when that happens, I don't think we see a bear because the bear before was just all the speculators leaving. But now these speculators are largely people fleeing for good reasons. So... I see the bear market being much more mild this time around as people woke up to Bitcoin's value and they, they come in and they store value in there permanently. And so I, I just don't think we're going to see that previous cycle from both a bear perspective. So how much drawdown will we have from the peak and also the bull? A lot of people reference the 2017 cycle because that drew in the most folks before this cycle. And they reference that as their, their anchor point for how a bull run looks. Well, in 2013, we actually had two bull runs. It went from ten dollars to two sixty, down to hundred in March twenty thirteen, and then later that year, from like October through December, it went from hundred to twelve hundred. So we could see something like that, and I would consider that to be a super cycle. You know, I would say that plus like a much more mild bear would constitute my description of a super cycle. How probable do I think this is? Who knows? I think knows? like when we look at how these cycles play out. No one exactly knows how it's going to play out. I just know that this one is different. And if this one is different, I think it's in a positive way, which would be a more intense bull run and a more mild bear bear market. Next up, I talked to Dan more about the Bitcoin super cycle. But before that, I've got a message from my amazing show sponsors. Today, we're kicking off with Sportsbet.io, the best place for online gaming because they accept Bitcoin. Love these guys. Now, listen, if you like Premier League football like me, if you've been watching the Premier League, you must have seen the Bitcoin logo. It's on the front of the Southampton shirt. It's wrapping around the Arsenal Stadium because Sportsbet.io did it. They love Bitcoin so much. They want to promote it to as many people as possible. And they're getting it out to football fans. Now listen, with Sportsbet, you have every market you could possibly be interested in. Football like me, but also they've got tennis, American sports, motorsports. They've even got esports. And for new customers, they always have a range of promotions available. So if you want to get on, you want to start betting against Tottenham, if you want Manu to lose, if you're confident Manu will lose, because they usually do, and you want to take a bet out on that, you can do that at sportsbet.io. And that is S-P-O-R-T-S-B-E-T dot I-O. Also, my newest sponsor, Exodus Wallet, they've been with me for a month now. And as I've been telling you, I needed a wallet that I could use for managing my company because I'm increasingly using Bitcoin. I use it to pay people. I use it to get paid. And what happens at the end of each month, I have to do all my accounts, I have to do all my figures, and then I have to go and pay people. And I've set myself up now with Exodus Wallet and I've done my first set of payments. Look, it's so cool. I love the wallet. It's so easy to use. And that was the thing about it. When they reached out to me and they said they want to sponsor the show, I was like, look, you can only sponsor it if I'm going to use your product. I checked it out. The UX is amazing and I'm happy with it. So I'm a fan of Exodus Wallet. But if you do want to check them out, head over to Exodus.io, search for Exodus in the Apple or Google App Stores or just Google Exodus. And lastly today... But never least, it's Casa, and it's not least because security is something you need to be aware of. We are in a bull market. Some of you are making some serious gains. And if you've not got your Bitcoin security shit together, well, you're going to be in some trouble. And I recommend going and checking out Casa. I've been a customer now for like eight months. And honestly, I was always sat there. I, I, I always talk about I have this little Jameson Lop who sits on my shoulder. Whenever I'm not doing security right, I feel like he's there with a... He's there like shouting at me and I felt like that for some time. That's when I reached out to Cast. I was like, look, you need to help me get this sorted. And they did. And now I am protected from my own mistakes 
which are easy to do, in-person attacks, device failure, and so much more. And if you want to check out Casa, they do have a product that suits every Bitcoiner. They've got Casa Gold, where you get triple the security of a hardware wallet, and that's only $10 a month. They've also got Casa Platinum, which is their 3 of 5 multi-sig, which is the best protection for large Bitcoin holders. And with Casa Diamond, you get their full service offering. That includes a customized personal security review, inheritance planning, and of course, their best-in-class security. There is no better time to upgrade your Bitcoin security and get total peace of mind. You can find out more at keys.casa, which is K-E-Y-S dot C-A-S-A. Let me tell you about another mindset shift I've had with this one as well. So previously, where I've calculated my Bitcoin wealth in pounds and dollars, I've looked at it and I've always thought, you know, what could this next cycle do? And I often refer to my personal trainer. Uh, I should, uh, uh, John, I should get him on one day, let people talk about it, because this guy is just like a guy bought Bitcoin. He doesn't understand x or any stuff like that. But he was saying to me when we were training last time, he was like, you know, what's your number? What's your target number? And, you know, when do you think you'll sell some? Because just tell me and I'll sell at the same time. And, you know, I talked about different numbers with him. But the last conversation I had with him is like, do you know what? I don't think I've got a target number to sell. And I'll tell you why. Say it's say it's, say it's 100K. And I said, what am I going to do? Sell 25% of my Bitcoin? 50% of my Bitcoin? What am I going to do? And then what? Put those pounds in the bank? What if it then overshoots that by even like 50%? I've suddenly lost out on all of that. Okay. So what if I said my target was 150 and it overshoots that? Or say it hits 150 and then suddenly drops down to 80. I'm like, oh shit, 150 at the top. I better sell some because it might go low and then it goes up again. It's like, I'm back to trying to pick the tops and bottoms of markets, which I just can't predict. So I'm not going to sell my Bitcoin. And, and and the reason being is I talk to people now about, you know, you need to work out your Bitcoin score. You know, you work out the percentage of the 21 million you've got, and that's your score. And I'm, I think I want to keep that as high as possible. So my future use for case of Bitcoin is to to use it, you know, we both we get both get challenged this, but we both agree with the idea of like uh, using our Bitcoin to loan to make interest. I also would uh, uh, happily take a loan out against my Bitcoin and let my Bitcoin work for me. But the reality is, why why sell any of it? What what's the point? Like you could play those tops and bottoms wrong, and you could end up with a lower stack of Bitcoin and then a pile of dollars or pounds, which we already know are fucking useless. So I've had a mind shift change now that I just have this goal down. Every month I want more Bitcoin than the previous month, and I accept it. Some point's going to shoot up, and then some point's going to shoot down. But like this is like my vault, which is setting me up for life and setting my family up for life. I've just got no need to sell it unless I need to sell it. And, and that's what's so funny is that in the previous cycles, there were a lot of early Bitcoiners who didn't really understand Bitcoin or appreciate it. They just yeah. randomly had a thousand Bitcoin. Then when Bitcoin hit a thousand dollars, they're like, I'm a millionaire and they sold everything. I yeah. actually know a couple of friends who did this. A lot of the OGs sold everything they had because they were just in it for the speculation. Not many really loved it or, or really appreciated it like I did. And I'm, there, there were tens of thousands of others who did, but a lot of the very like public folks didn't really get it. No, and why would you sell it if you've come to this conclusion that it will be the next goal 2.0? Sure, there's a lot of risks in, in holding it, but I think like when you look at its value prop and like where it can go, the return of Bitcoin out far far outstrips anything else. And I would say Bitcoin's risk is lower than almost every traditional asset. Like with a company, the company could go under. Like if I buy Apple, if I buy Google, is that probability high? No. But there's still a probability of that, whereas Bitcoin isn't a company. It's a protocol. That risk profile is much, much smaller. As Bitcoin has survived over time, over 12 years, we build more and more faith in it over time. I mean, you're being paid for to take on the risk, the early adopter risk of believing in something before others believed in it. And, you know, with this cycle, I think it's going to be funny because you're going to see a lot of these older Bitcoiners who might want to, you know, cash out. And look, if you want to buy a house, if you've got a partner who goes, look, if we don't buy this house, I'm going to leave you. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> you know? Well, do you know what? That that thing's okay as well. Like the other thing you can't buy is time, right? You can have as much Bitcoin as you want, but you can't buy time. And look, that's one thing I would maybe do. Go, look, I mean, we don't, we have just a normal British detached house, right? Nothing special at all. You know, if I could get a slightly nicer house, I felt like me and the kids would have a great 10, 20 years use of that. That's worth it. That's something that's worth doing. So I don't. I don't take that away from anyone. Totally. And so everyone's got their own time preference. You only live once. You know, if you hodl till you die, then you, you know, sure, you're free to do that. But 
you know, ultimately you'd like to either generate a yield from it, borrow against it, or sell it. I have become recently fascinated with the idea of never selling, just like yourself. Hmm. If the ship is sinking, why the hell would you sell your seat on the lifeboat? <laughs> like, you're, I don't care how much the seat is, you're, you're, then you're on the sinking ship with a bunch of dollars and nowhere to go. So for me, I think it's kind of, I think it'll be really funny if some of these Bitcoiners who've been around for a while don't, and who don't fully grok why Bitcoin's valuable, sell their seat on the ship, on these lifeboats, right when everyone, right when the whole world is trying to get in. You know, that's, that's the reason why the price is going higher is that the whole world is waking up to Bitcoin's value and trying to get some. Now, there's a couple different really cool ways to minimize the, your, you know, especially the, uh, the, uh, the, um, you know, the worry that when you sell, you'll, you'll sell and Bitcoin keeps going higher. And also the idea that you'll have less of a Bitcoin stack. There's three ways that I think are really cool. You and I have both covered earning yield on your Bitcoin that comes with risk. People pay you to you lend your Bitcoin out to folks. They use it for different trading activities and you earn a yield on it. So you can earn sort of like an income stream from your coins. This comes with risk. That's why you're earning the yield. It is not risk-free. The two other ways, borrowing against your Bitcoin. And I'm going to announce this here first on, on this show because you and I were in a recent thread with Pompliano and Willie Wu where you and I last year were making fun of Pomp for his Bitcoin percentage allocation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Willie hopped into that old thread a couple of days ago and made fun of you and I. I'm actually at, <laughs> I'm over 100%. You're over now. I'm over. So I did this a year ago. I got an Unchained Capital loan. And this isn't a shill. I don't actually earn any affiliate revenue from Unchained Capital. I took out an Unchained Capital loan when Bitcoin was $7,000 and used that to buy more Bitcoin. So you didn't tell me this. Capital. I haven't told almost anyone about this because they sound like a freaking degenerate. <laughs> well, because I did it right. I did it when it was at 17 and a half. Uh, I was just laying in bed and I was like, how much would the bank give me? 35, right? 2.55 Bitcoin, done. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. I wish I'd done a lot more previously, but you know. So this is a way you can minimize selling your Bitcoin or you could you could add more to your Bitcoin stack. Now, this comes with a very dangerous proposition. Mm -hmm. Price at 3,800. I didn't get mar I did not get margin called, but it was getting pretty damn close. And I don't think I've ever had a more stressful moment in my life. Okay. okay. When you borrow dollars against your Bitcoin, if the value of your Bitcoin drops and it gets close to the loan value, you could be margin called, which means you have either have to post more collateral or pay back the loan. So mar going on margin or borrowing dollars against your Bitcoin is not a risk free operation either. It can be extremely stressful, especially with Bitcoin's volatility. Now, given my perception of what the future bull and bear market will be, if you set the parameter really, really low or you borrow a very low amount of dollars versus the collateral you post, you should be okay. So that's one way to minimize your, you know, any sort of like loss aversion when, when it comes to selling your Bitcoin. And then the third would be like a covered call strategy. You can earn a yield by selling your upside on your Bitcoin past a certain price. So for example, if you sell the upside on your Bitcoin past $100,000 at the end of March, other traders will compensate you for that opportunity or that optionality. It comes at a huge risk. If you don't structure it properly, you've now sold your upside past a certain price on your coins to where you earn all of the upside from here to 100,000, but you've foregone all upside past 100,000. And in a world where governments are entering crazy money printing operations, selling your upside past a certain point, it feels very, very risky because folks come in and, mm. and you're like, well, am I actually earning a yield or am I just maintaining purchasing power in Bitcoin's price? is just climbing due to how much money is being printed, right? So mm. in that regard, like these yields look semi-attractive, but it might not actually be an attractive opportunity. Ultimately, the margin one, a borrowing dollars against your Bitcoin, I think will become the most popular way to minimize selling your Bitcoin. And actually, this feeds into why I think this super cycle will exist. In the previous cycles, if you were a Bitcoiner and you wanted to exit, all you could do was sell your Bitcoin. That's it. Mm. You couldn't borrow against your Bitcoin. You couldn't yield, uh, lend it out to earn yield. There wasn't even any options in the space. So with this this time around, there's going to be a lot less coins being sold during the bull run, which will exacerbate you know, the uh, scarcity element as scarcity becomes higher and higher. Then when the demand climbs, there's, there's less and less coins to buy. Now, the margin side, I am very fascinated with. I've spent a bunch of time, my first... I first entered a margin position with Unchained Capital, but the interest rates are around 11%, which is extremely high. Wow. Yeah. I mean, very painful to service that debt. I mean, so, if, you, if you like that period, I guess, where it sits around 10000 for quite a while, 
that's expensive. Yeah, it was painful to be. It eats away. Yeah, yeah. Especially when I dropped a thirty eight hundred. <laughs> yeah, dude, dude. <laughs> yeah, so you had to be really convicted. I mean, I'm more convicted than many people, um, but. I think Bitcoin as a piece of collateral is a pristine piece of collateral. You can borrow dollars against your equities. So say you have an interactive broker's account and you borrow dollars against your Tesla stock. That rate is 1% to 2% a year because they have collateral. They can instantly liquidate that and pay back the loan if you don't pay back the loan. Now, with a mortgage, you have the same thing. You have a home. But a mortgage is a really, like a home is a really shitty piece of collateral. It's they're not fungible. One home does not equal one home. They have high maintenance costs. They have all sorts of like damages that can occur to it. You have property insurance. You have all these things. And then it takes a while to to process like a sale of the home. Bitcoin is a pristine piece of fungible collateral. And so the interest rate that you pay on a Bitcoin loan in the future, I would say should be close to 0% almost. I would say like in the future, when you borrow dollars against your Bitcoin, that is such a phenomenally risk-free trade for the counterparty who's lending you the dollars that they will likely accept a very low rate of return in the future. That's where well, I the, see it probably one to two percent. I mean, it's this this is a very early like the financialization of the Bitcoin is very early, and and also not a, not everyone's a fan of it. You know that I know yet that I've got some shit. Pomp's got some shit. You have. Yeah. Um, I still think it's uh, an uh, it's an optional. Uh, uh, these these are optional products and they're useful to people. I don't. Uh, it's interesting out those things because. I thought of borrowing against my Bitcoin and then to buy more Bitcoin, but that that made me nervous. I I essentially my my approach was to borrow against. I was essentially borrowing against my business, right? I knew I had the cash flow to support that. I mean, eight hundred dollar a month payments, nothing compared to the business cash flow. So I knew I could easily support that, and I didn't have to risk my Bitcoin, but acquired more Bitcoin through it. And it was a bit of an experiment. I actually kind of wish I'd borrowed a lot more, but you know, by the by, it is what it is. But I mean, the point being is like. I think when we're talking about this idea of a super cycle, it just adds into the uh, mature narrative. You know, we've got professional institutional grade custody. We've got gray onboarding products. Um, we've got Bitcoin in nearly every market in the world. Uh, we've now got the financialization through companies like Unchained and BlockFi. Uh, we've got the regulatory mode. We have COVID. We have governments printing money at ridiculous rates. Um, like you say, everything's feeding into this cycle the super cycle i only th i think we've got one thing working against us just one thing and i think it's unit price i think it's the only <laughs> thing that works against us let me touch on one more point around uh borrowing and margin and then we'll go to yeah, go uh, unit like denomination so uh pierre rochard and others have described this as a speculative attack with the yeah. fed and other central banks holding interest rates so low it's really cheap to borrow fiat well, if you can borrow fiat and at a super low rate, like 2% a year, 3% a year, Bitcoin becomes an incredibly interesting opportunity. So there's a speculative attack where folks start to borrow as many dollars or euros or yen as they can to buy Bitcoin. And Bitcoin just gets pushed up with that sort of incentive, with that sort of momentum, which is sort of like I think what we'll see in this cycle is like people look at really cheap dollars to borrow and go, well, Bitcoin's return is phenomenal and I can borrow dollars for 2%. <laughs> So we're going to, I think that's a in really interesting speculative attack that Pierre hypothesized back in the day. And I think we're going to see in this cycle where all this debt will be generated just to buy Bitcoin. Uh, but to go to, you know, what you're asking about, which is around the unit denomination, like, is that a. And by the way, I think the unit denomination is mainly a retail issue, not a institutional issue. I think institutions will be looking at some people, like, oh, this is too expensive, but they can easily be sold on it. I think it's pri primarily a retail issue. Yeah, I think it's definitely a more retail issue. Um, this is why you know folks like to buy stocks that are cheaper per share price, and and most mm -hmm. fractional shares didn't really exist until a few years ago, like in terms of popularity. So folks before had to buy whole shares. That's why I think there's a lot of confusion with retail around Bitcoin because they're used to having to buy whole shares of a company. Bitcoin, you can buy one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, a Satoshi, and it, it's funny because people have asked me, "What do you think Satoshi did wrong?" And so I, I do agree with you, Bitcoin has a denomination problem. I don't think it's like, in terms of Bitcoin's outcome, like how much more would it have been adopted if we had changed this? I think it's like sub double digit percentage of like adoption. Right? Okay, so interesting. I don't think it's like, a, <clears throat> I don't think it would have been like huge. It, it, I think it definitely would have changed it. So Satoshi, why did he pick 21 million 
versus 21 billion or 210 billion. I'm not sure if he, you know, I think, and, and he doesn't really talk about this at all. So this is largely an extrapolation. I think Satoshi was like cautiously optimistic about Bitcoin. I think he wanted it to break dollar parity sooner than later, which would then give it huge value to people where they go, oh, Bitcoin's worth more mm-hmm. than a dollar. So I think that's why he put the decimal where he did. You know, with with currencies like Ripple, we can definitely see the effect of of making that, you know, moving that decimal, you make people feel wealthier, especially like Dogecoin too. Dogecoin was one of the first currencies to do that where they had, you know, an issuance of billions of the currency, um, like units of the currency. So I definitely think it's it's a it's a negative thing that we have to fight against. I think exchanges like Kraken, which I work at Kraken and Coinbase and others, we could do a better job around maybe having smaller denominations where we go, hey, you you don't know what the word sats are, so we're not going to say that, but we might show you that you can buy a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. You know that might be a way for us to, you know, more easily convey that Bitcoin is granular that you can buy a, a lower denomination of it. I think Sats are awesome. Yeah. I like Sats, but I don't think like P- mainstream doesn't know what Sats are. But I think that's coming, and I will tell you why I think that's coming. Because once you get over hundred uh, k Bitcoin, it actually becomes kind of a little bit pointless to price things in Bitcoin. Like before Silk Road, right? You want to buy a bag of weed, it was two point four Bitcoin, right? It makes sense, right? Like even even now, um, you know, if you, yeah, I don't know, you want to buy want to buy a Lambo, six Bitcoin, but like once you have over hundred k and you want to buy like a Trezor, it's not going to make sense. It's not point, but it makes a lot more sense to say, oh, it's fifty thousand sats or five hundred thousand sats, whatever the number is, it starts to make sense, and I think we'll see that transition into sats just because it makes sense to price things in sats. I totally agree. Sats will be the standard. Me and Adam Back have, we poked some fun. We triggered some people on Twitter where we were into bits. I personally was a fan of bits back in 2014. So a little bit of history here. Bits as a denomination was a, was a movement that was started in 2014. I personally backed it as well. It wasn't about repricing Bitcoin. It was having a, a smaller denomination called bits. Ultimately, they didn't plan out. I like bits personally because it's Bitcoin and bits. Like it makes sense, right? Bits is a smaller mm-hmm. portion of Bitcoin. That doesn't matter because Sats became the standard. Sats became what everyone recognized as the smaller denomination. It's also the smallest denomination on chain, which makes it scalable for the future. So if Bitcoin succeeds and has a super cycle, bits actually may be not the right denomination because we might quickly pass that moment when it's worth like dollar parity and where Sats Sats would be a much better uh, longer term denomination to choose so yes the future will be in sats i do think on the exchange level though like right now in 2021 folks don't know what sats are who are new to bitcoin in you know, over the next decade they will but you know for them you'd probably want to just show them hey you can buy a hundred dollars worth of bitcoin for yeah. them, that's much more approachable so i think that's definitely i mean you know i know at kraken we're always looking to make user experiences easier or trying to make it easier to buy bitcoin and understand bitcoin so I'm sure us and others, you know, everyone's probably exploring how to solve this problem. I don't think it's a hugely detrimental issue. I thought Bitcoin had this denomination problem when Bitcoin was ten dollars. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So yeah, well, let, you get a hundred thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand. It doesn't seem to have affected it too much. So let me ask you, Dan. Through the cycle, what are you looking at? What makes this a super cycle? Like, have you got certain metrics? You're like, okay, is it like the length of the bull market? Is it whether we have a drawdown? Is it, you know, how high it goes? I mean, I, like I said, I've seen these range of predictions. Plan B has got the famous 2881. I think I've seen Woody Woo put it somewhere at 400. I think Dan at Pantera has got a more conservative, like 126. Rao Powell did one that could go up to 1.2 million. Like, there's a range big range out there like is yeah. it the price that makes it a super cycle what makes this a super cycle that's a that's a great question i think the price is the probably large price is the cleanest distillation of all of the narratives so i think price is what we look at to define a super cycle yes sure there's a lot of on-chain metrics and volume and everything else but the price is the cleanest distillation or as product folks might call it the kpi I think, you know, we look at, if we, there's a whole bunch of ways to look at this, right? If we look at what a traditional cycle would look like, you know, people are looking at between anywhere between 100,000 and 250,000. That's using like historical price action. That's, that's looking at like a decaying rate of return with the cycles. 
there's a million ways to slice this, right? So I think like, I think between 100 and 400 K would be, or 100, between 100 and 300 K would be defined as a classic cycle. A super cycle would maybe take that a little bit higher to like plus 800,000, right? So that's where maybe a super cycle, I would maybe use it that as the definition of one is like going past like 800,000 or closer to a million. I think that would be like, if, and I don't, by the way, I, super cycle is more of a fun idea to throw around and, and think through. And and the reason why I like it too is that almost every single time I've looked at Bitcoin over the last eight years in every single market, the status quo is typically wrong. Like whatever everyone's predicting, it's probably not going to do that. And no one's predicting a super cycle. No one's really thinking about like, oh, wait, this time is very different. People are like, oh, let's look at the last two bull runs. I'm like, yeah, but the last two bull runs didn't have COVID or anything. And so I think that, yeah, like I would say like close to a million is what the KPI would be for a super cycle. And why I like it is no one's talking about it. No no one even thinks that's possible. And and everyone just thinks it's going to do what it did before. And it's a very different environment. Let me throw another thing in there. One more thing. So Nick Carter and Mike Green's conversation, Mike Green uh, focused on that Bitcoin's a potential national security threat. I disagree with him, but he's saying essentially because countries like Iran and uh, Russia have access to, if the state wants to mine pa- uh, Bitcoin like they have in Venezuela, they essentially have free power. They essentially, they can print free money in some ways. I mean, obviously yeah. there, there is a certain amount of cost, but I, I think it would be negligible in terms of like impact upon um inflation but they can essentially print free money and he talks about them printing free dollars i actually think they're talking about printing free bitcoin and actually proves the strength of bitcoin but by the by um if other countries start to see this and start saying hold on we have access and any country which has a struggling economy i mean argentina why why isn't the government in argentina you know printing uh you know, mining bitcoin i mean they all own the power grids within their country but also, could even even the USG look at this? And I mean, I don't know if this is sinking too yeah. far. I would say, well, hold on, we should be mining if everyone else is. That is the real scenario where we start to see Bitcoin being a race amongst states to accumulate. Totally, and this is one of the final stages of of Bitcoin success. Is when central banks start to buy Bitcoin. Is when sovereign wealth funds buy Bitcoin, and when governments start to enter mining. This would be considered like a very late stage of Bitcoin being successful. And we're starting. Well, they've entered mining. Venezuela's mining, Iran is mining, <laughs> yeah. Russia's yeah, mining. I mean, we're starting to see glimmers of this. And yeah. what's what's really wild though is like when you look at governments, they they you know they have control over their population. They also typically have control over energy, which means that they could probably want to they probably want to harness that and utilize that to print more coins. Um, what's interesting is governments in the future could create bonds based on this as well, where they like buy a bunch of miners and create like a government bond where you can buy into like this mining operation on like a huge, you know, hundred billion dollar operation or something, you know, something really massive. But yeah, in the future, you know, it'll be a combination of both companies and governments that mine or, or some sort of quasi maybe in between, if it's a more free market society, it'll be mainly companies. If it's like a uh, kind of a mixture of both, maybe uh, governments contract with free uh, with uh, companies to go mine for them, but yeah, essentially you're going to see the Bitcoin harnessing all of the excess electricity in the world, and there's a lot of it. And governments mm-hmm. are going to look at Bitcoin's rise in price and go, "Well, how do we get more of this?" And they're likely going to want to tap into this free energy that they have. And so, yeah, Bitcoin, you know, increasingly starts to get woven throughout the fabric of both governments, companies, and people. Damn, Dan. It's going to be a wild few more years for us on this Bitcoin train. Is there any part of this uh, super cycle I've not asked you about or any part of it that I've not covered with you? I think that's, you know, we didn't spend a ton of time on narrative. I think like we touched on it earlier about Bitcoin being the singular narrative, but I I don't think people really understood how confusing 2017 was. Like Mm -hmm. you had a Bitcoin and you had Pyrite, which is Bcash. And that was pretty confusing for folks. They're like, what's the real Bitcoin? And, and there's a lot of muddying of the waters on the Confederates side, which I would consider the Bcashers. They're the Confederates, right? They're the Confederates who ultimately lost this battle. But, you know, there's a lot of confusion there. They tried to muddy the waters. Uh, certain wealthy individuals tried to pay off companies and people. And, you know, that was a huge headwind for Bitcoin, a massive one. That was one of the most stressful moments in Bitcoin for me because you had the community fight itself. It was a civil war. And, um, you know, we don't... Well, better it happened then than now. Totally. And we got that out of the way. 
And in Bitcoin survived that, which was an incredible thing. Like Ethereum and none of these other coins really have had that moment. Yeah, sure, Ethereum has Ethereum Classic, but no one's on that. Like no one cares about Ethereum Classic. And so Bitcoin had a huge headwind then and the ICOs and Ethereum craze. Bitcoin doesn't have any of that. I mean, the institutions are only buying Bitcoin and Bitcoin's narrative is perfectly highlighted by this macro environment. I think that that means that, you know, Bitcoin really accrues a lot of the demand that had previously gone to other alts. And that makes me really, really excited because it just, it, it is such a nice crystallization, uh, a compression of the only, what I would consider the only meaningful narrative in the space, which is that Bitcoin's a great store of value. And, and, and that I think will be huge. So I don't think we can underestimate how beneficial a singular narrative will be for Bitcoin. Massive, man. All right, Dan. Well, listen, always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm going to be talking to you a couple of times over the next week, which I'm uh, really going to enjoy. Uh, appreciate you coming on to cover this with me. Just let people know where to find out more about all this amazing content you're producing. Um, I, I was on your YouTube today. I was watching your video regarding Tether, which was great. So thank you for that. But just tell people where to find your work. Yeah, so this is an interesting question. If you're on Twitter, I'm Dan Held. Uh, if you like kind of like longer form newsletter style content, uh, check out Dan Held Substack. That's where my email newsletter is. I send that out every Thursday. I've got some fresh takes on different Bitcoin topics. And then if you like video content, I actually take that newsletter and then turn it into a video on YouTube. So same there, Dan Held. Pretty easy. If you just Google Dan Held, whichever way you like to ingest content, Twitter, short form, longer form newsletter or video, that's where you can find everything that I talk about, which is mainly a, a bunch of different Bitcoin topics explained very simply. Well, I'll put it all in the show notes. Um, I've, your emails become a real kind of pleasure of mine. Um, you, the email touches always on a specific topic, so each one's like a lesson. So very cool, man. I appreciate you. Uh, appreciate all the work you do. Appreciate you as a friend. Thanks for coming on and doing this, dude. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to chat to you in the next few days. I had a blast, and I can't wait to record the other episodes. Cheers. All right, brother. All right. What do you think of that? Did you enjoy that? It's always great to get Dan on the show. I love listening to Dan talk about Bitcoin. He's very articulate. has a very good way of explaining topics. And as I said, just go and check out his newsletter. Links to that are in the show notes. He's sending out these regular emails explaining topics in a way like someone like I can understand. So if I can understand it, you can understand it. Now, this was another one of those conversations that makes me bullish as fuck. There's been loads of them recently. I'm so bullish right now. Uh, I've only been properly around for one bull market. Like, I experienced 2013, but I wasn't really a Bitcoiner. But I've done a proper bull market and bull session now. And do you know what? Something feels different from 2017. The whole industry is a lot more mature. And while I have no idea whether we will see a super cycle, as Dan explained, with everything that's happened in the world, I wouldn't rule it out. And as I said in the intro, these shows with Dan will be continuing all week. So make sure you check back on Friday for our show about what Silicon Valley doesn't understand about Bitcoin. And we're going to probably do another one on Sunday talking about how a Bitcoin standard happens. In the meantime, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. It's hello at whatbitcoindid.com. As I say, I always reply to everyone. Just don't send me any weird stuff. Don't, don't like those weird emails. I've had a couple of weird ones recently. Just don't send me that weird shit. Okay, if you do want to support the show, I ask you, can you just go to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review? Or if you can't do that, go onto Google or whatever app it is. Just leave reviews. It's really helpful. It really helps with the listings. Outside of that, check out Defiance on Thursday. We've got a show coming out about Wall Street bets and those crazy bastards. And also, I've just launched my new newsletter. That's it, neveredit.com. Sign up for a Monday to Friday daily update on stuff relating to tech, Bitcoin, and macroeconomics. All right, have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you crazy bastards on Friday. <laughs>